I have uh, two kids. Uh, my daughter's name is Willow. She's six years old, and my Griffin's <coughs> uh, my son. He's four. And I know it's a little bit early, uh, but I'm already looking uh, for high schools for them. And so I was at a high school recently. It was an evening event. And in this evening event, there were some uh, young kids, about 13, who were talking to the parents, parents of prospective kids who might go there, about what it had been like to transition from being the oldest in the eighth grade, the oldest in a junior high school, uh, and it's a much more sheltered environment, to being the youngest, and now a teenager, and a freshman in this high school. And this one person, this one 13-year-old boy, was trying to describe what it felt like to have transitioned there. And he was searching for the words. He was trying to say that what was really hard about it was the social interactions. It wasn't the academic work or other things. And after he tried a couple times, he captured it like this. He said, I was having a hard time. I didn't really know what I should do. And then I realized. It was like Facebook, only in real life. And then it was easy. And I thought, my God, what has the world come to when people learn their social interactions? This isn't a value judgment. But they learn their social interactions from Facebook first and then struggle on how to do that in the real world. The point that I'm trying to make is that the world has changed a lot in the last 20 years. And the personal computer now allows us to do things that when the personal computer was released 25 years ago, just weren't possible. It wasn't technologically possible, but it also wasn't socially possible. And we didn't have the imagination for it. We couldn't have stomached the idea that I just described to you, even though it is now commonplace. The idea that people would store all of their music, purchase much of their music, and replay their music on their computer, it was sort of doable 25 years ago, but the infrastructure wasn't there, the concept of doing it wasn't there. When the personal computer was first introduced in the late 1970s, it was for spreadsheets, and there was actually a very different kind of personal computer, which was essentially for video games. Even 20 years ago, word processing had been added, but it was still a very small set of the things that we now consider the purpose of personal computers. And it would have been prescient, to put it mildly, for someone back then, 20, 25 years ago, to have seen what it could become. Let me give you one or two other examples, and then I'll get to body monitoring. Aluminum was first really um, distilled from ore in the early 1800s. And by the late 1800s, 50 years later, it was still slightly more expensive than silver. So it has a very rich history in design and architecture. And I went to a show, one of these blockbuster art shows about aluminum design and architecture. And there was this little, there was a hat stand in the corner. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Well, I wonder why they put the hat stand in the corner. I don't have a hat. And then I noticed that it had just, it was mostly made of wood, but it had little bits of aluminum on it. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. Maybe it's part of the show because it has these little bits of aluminum. It's not much aluminum, but aluminum used to be very expensive, so maybe that makes sense. And then I went over and I took a look at it. And there was a plaque next to it. It was part of the show. It wasn't made of wood. The whole thing was made of aluminum. I thought, what? On Earth, why would you take something which was exciting and new and technical and expensive and go to all the work to meticulously paint it to look old and normal and boring? And it's because that's what a hat, hat stand was. That's what people thought of. And Alcoa, the largest maker of aluminum in the world, was trying to tell people that other things could be done. This was made in the early 1900s, about 1924, I think that you could do other things with it. But it was a fundamental lacking of imagination, both on the part of the public and on the part of the maker of that hat stand, about what aluminum was going to become. At first, you have to just take, when you have new technologies, you have to take where you are and take little baby steps. It's the paradox of new technologies. 
You know, when the cell phone first came out, the first cell phone was released um, by NTT Docomo, or it wasn't, it was just NTT at the time here in Japan. And at the time, it was for making a phone call, period. Now, I brought my iPhone here from the United States. I can't make a call because singular AT&T doesn't see fit to let it work here in Japan. But I couldn't be without my iPhone. This is my camera, this is my calendar, this is everything to me. Even though it doesn't make phone calls, I still couldn't be apart from it. NTT, when they made that first cell phone, they couldn't have imagined that. What I'm trying to describe to you is that body monitoring is a platform and we don't recognize its full potential yet. We don't recognize one, one one hundredth of its potential yet. I'm gonna take you through where I think body monitoring has been and where it is now and where it can go in the future as we currently conceive of it. But what I wanna get you excited about is that that's not the point. It's not the point any more than word processing and spreadsheets were the point of the personal computer. Body monitoring is going to change the world every bit as much as the telegraph did, as the personal computer did. And I don't think that we see that clearly yet. So that's what I want to impart to you today. So body monitoring uh, has a long and I think noble history. People have been looking at uh, the human body for a long time. Really, modern body monitoring started in the late 1800s with uh, electrocardiogram, you know, looking at the electrical potential difference between different points in the body as a way to see the electrical activity of the heart because it told you something about the mechanical activity of the heart. And uh, really, the next big step that happened in body monitoring was taken by some of the space agencies, particularly by the Russians and by the US, because they wanted to monitor people up in space, so they had to untether um, things a bit. But body monitoring at that time, still pretty much to this day, involved um, glue onto people's bodies, often shaving hair off of their skin to make sure you had good contact, gel to improve the contact with the skin. And it was uh, really actually kind of a breakthrough, polar electro, uh, which many of you have seen, I'm sure, these straps that go around the middle of your chest. It wasn't a deep um, piece of technology. It wasn't a uh, breakthrough in science. Um, but they thought they bothered to make something that people could wear and would wear, at least for brief periods of time, outside of the lab. And, f and they really were the people who originated consumer body monitoring. So, you know, body monitoring has had lots of other aspects, but I see that as sort of the main trunk of the origination of body modern body monitoring. And there were some assumptions that were made along the way. Let me be clear, when I say body monitoring, what I'm talking about is continuous body monitoring. I'm looking at unobtrusive body monitoring, the kind of body monitoring that would fit in the world that Takeo was just talking about. Not an MRI machine is monitoring your body, but it's a big room, essentially, that you go inside. Anything with wheels, anything that glues to your skin, that's not body monitoring. I'm talking about the kind of body monitoring that I have on my body now and that you would all accept on your bodies and leave on your bodies for the rest of your life like you would your glasses or your, a ring on your finger. So there were assumptions that were made by the body monitoring world and they didn't know they were making it. No one was trying to be bad when they made it but they turned out to be very limiting assumptions. So the first assumption they made was that you had to get the best information you could get. That doesn't sound like such an offensive thing to try to get, right? But once you commit yourself that any reduction in quality of information is unacceptable, you put yourself into a box that turns out to be very hard to get out of. You make things that are very expensive, very fragile, very hard to use. Then you've made it essentially inevitable that they can only list inside of the hospitals because they're expensive and fragile and hard to use. Once they're in the hospitals, you don't have to worry anymore what your customers, the wearers, think of the body monitor because at that moment they're patients and they're sick and they're scared so you can tell them what to do. 
and uh, especially in the United States, telling people what to do as soon as they leave even in the hospital, but soon, certainly once they're out of the hospital, does not work very well. But the doctors don't see this because they're so stuck in the mindset that body monitoring almost by definition happens within the walls of the hospital. The, the doctors have also become used to the algorithms that run in their heads. There are a set of things that they're trained in medical school, not just the doctors, but the nurses as well. They're trained on how to diagnose somebody from a set of symptoms. And so they have this pool of things that they're taught at how to use and this decision tree that they go through to come up with a diagnosis. So introducing new things, very hard, very hard to do because it's not in their algorithms. And if you look at like the last substantial new body monitoring signal that was introduced, it was pulse oximetry, and it was introduced over 20 years ago. And it's only now fairly mainstream in our, in our uh, medical communities worldwide. So the state of body monitoring has picked up over the last 10 years, I would say. Um, and I would like to think that uh, my company, Body Media, has done some uh, good in that area. There are now a wide range of body monitors from the very inexpensive pedometer that you can buy for a one US dollar all the way up to much more expensive but out of the hospital kinds of things that allow for real-time monitoring at anywhere at any time for emergency applications. And there's a good range in between. There are implantable products now um, that have monitoring uh, along them. So for example, if you have an implanted pacemaker inside of your chest, something that's timing your heart, there are now sensors inside that pacemaker that actually adjust how fast to run your heart so that if it sees that your body is jiggling up and down, it guesses that maybe you're exercising and then it ups the pace at which it's pumping your heart or it's sending the little timing signal to your heart. Uh, you know, it used to be the case that doctors would think, well, we have to make the decisions because computers can't be trusted to make the decisions. That was one of these limiting assumptions. They didn't say this out loud, but it's just how it felt to them, and it became one of their golden rules. And because they were requiring that, and because they were requiring that they understood the mechanism of the human body, again, it sounds like such a, a simple thing to ask for. It doesn't count as science, right? If you don't understand why the human body is letting a signal out, then you can't trust the signal, right? No, that doesn't make any sense at all, actually. Just because you don't know what the signal means doesn't mean that you can't model it. If you can make a mathematical model of how the human body radiates data, and it's predictive, that's as good as science gets. We really kid ourselves when we add these human anthropomorphic models on top and say that we understand. There is no understanding in science other than the predictiveness of the models. So they're asking to, for this mechanism of the human body and this shoehorns them into looking at signals individually. That's how it had been for a long, long time. And only very recently has it been the case and my company, Body Media, was one of the ones that I think helped to push this frontier to say, no, 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 it doesn't have to be that way. What if you took many different signals from the body? If you have domain expertise, fine, but don't require domain expertise. We're going to model how the human body radiates data independent of why the human body produces those signals. And if we can come up with an algorithm, a statement, a mathematical prediction about what that person's current state is that can be validated against medical gold standard equipment, good enough. 10 years ago, that was heresy. I'm happy to say that that is no longer heresy in the medical world, and so that's a big step in the right direction, I think. Design used to be seen as irrelevant in the medical world. I mean, obviously there were talented industrial designers in the medical world, but often, especially in body monitoring, design was seen the way the iMac was perceived early on. You remember when the first iMac came out um, and it had colors, it was like tangerine colored and aqua, and they had all kinds of exciting names. And all of the other computer makers basically said, well, that's just, it's a toy. And it turns out people really cared about those colors. But honestly, it was just colors in the case of the iMac. There was nothing deeper about it. That's not the case with body monitoring. 
When you're on somebody's body, you can't separate the design from the functionality because how you touch their skin, how it adheres and whether or not that means that you need gel in order to see their skin, how it actually changes what you're sensing. If you occlude the skin, but you wanna see the heat of the skin, then you're actually, the, des the details of the design change the very thing that you're monitoring. And so I think there's now a much richer sense that it matters exactly how the thing is designed. Also, there's been a trend in body monitoring from medical grade or it's junk and it's a gadget, right? That was seen as two worlds that never could touch. Now there is a world or there's starting to be respect for that place in the middle, which is medical grade, but consumer desirable. And that's so important in body monitoring because if you won't make it consumer desirable, they won't wear it outside the hospital. And if they won't wear it outside the hospital, it doesn't matter what it does. So let me talk for just a minute about the future of body monitoring. And then I'm gonna try to um, limber us up a little bit because I think all of this is just setting the stage for it doesn't matter. This isn't the point. This is the first killer application, but it's not where we're gonna end up. So uh, some of the things that I'm interested in that are coming next in body monitoring. Uh, there's a lot of work that's being done uh, by Body Media, but by several other companies as well, in the area of ultra-thin uh, Band-Aid-like sensors that are actually disposable. Uh, you will see that as a very um, inevitable next step in body monitoring. Not that all body monitors will be disposable, but increasingly that will be the case. Uh, new sensors in general. Um, Microneedles have come a long way. Microneedles are, um, uh, they feel kind of like sandpaper, but when you look really, really closely at them, they're little pyramids. Uh, they're somewhat different shapes, but you can think of them as tiny little pyramids that are sticking up every, um, you know, 50 or 100 microns spread out across the surface that are between 50 and 150 microns high. Um, so you can't really feel it, but what they do is they press very effectively through the first dead layer of your skin and if you coat the various sides of these things, you can actually get a much better contact with the skin without the need for gel or adhesive, assuming that you hold it against the body properly. And that's opened up a number of different things. It also turns out that once you press through that first layer of skin, it becomes easier to deliver certain kinds of drugs. In fact, a broad variety of things now can be delivered through the skin that couldn't be. There was uh, an advance over the last 20 years called iontophoresis. Iontophoresis is using an, um, a DC current, a constant current that kind of forces those molecules through your skin. They're kind of too big to get through or you know, as they get interesting, they tend to get bigger and bigger, the molecules. But if you, you have a force on the other side, like a DC current, which connect, creates a little magnetic field, you can kind of push some more through the skin. Usually you just push it faster, but that still matters. It turns out there's been a very recent release, uh, which is using alternating current instead. And when you use an alternating current, then you take these big molecules, which look like soccer balls, and you stretch them into cigars. And when you stretch them into cigars, then they can kind of slip through along their narrow access into your skin much easier. And as more and more drugs can be delivered through the skin, we're gonna see uh, a tighter, feedback loop between the thing that is changing your body and the thing which is sensing your body. So you can imagine the power potentially of a Band-Aid, which not only would give you uh, an analgesic, um, like a Tylenol or Advil, but actually senses when you need it and gives you just the right amount at just the right times. You could get more benefit with less toxicity for doing that, and while um, the FDA in the United States and regulatory bodies like Japan are still quite leery about these closed loop systems that's changing quite quickly. One of the reasons it's changing quite quickly is because implanted wearable devices are moving quite quickly now. Uh, probably the first really big one that we're gonna be hearing a lot about 
uh, those of you who are already in this space already have been, is the artificial pancreas. People are making a lot of progress on the artificial pancreas for helping diabetics. This is um, insulin uh, that you're helping somebody with. And so being able to sense what the blood needs or what the body needs through looking at the blood from the inside and then automatically giving the body that thing uh, and talking to external wearable devices uh, which then can communicate longer distances, et cetera, is all part of what I think is sort of the universe of um, body monitoring as it's sort of moving along right now. There are new methodologies that are happening. So the medical community, particularly in the United States, but in lots of other countries as well, sort of folded its arms for a long time and it said, no, you don't exist, that technology doesn't exist, I don't just mean body medias, I mean new technology in general for body monitoring. And they were insistent that they were only going to make the health management programs to help people around the technologies they already liked. And so it's a little bit of a chicken and egg to introduce these new technologies. But at this point, the problems of obesity and diabetes and cardiovascular disease, these longer term chronic condition kinds of problems are so big now in the first world that health management is starting to catch up. Health management is now starting to look at these out of the hospital body monitors and really make programs to help people. And in the end, the way healthcare works you can't actually get value out of the technology unless you wrap around it some use of that technology, a health management program. So that's a big deal. It's also very exciting that now that there are a number of monitors like the ones that my company Body Media makes out there, we are now starting to get into a positive feedback cycle. Body Media has already collected 5 billion minutes of human physiologic data on more than 100,000 people. People who wear Body Media's products wear them an average of 15 hours a day. Think of how many people that now is out in the real world who we can see when they go to bed at night, when they get up in the morning how physically they active they are, how much they fidget at work, how much they jog, how long their commutes are. This is a kind of data which has never been collected before. And as Body Media and other companies start to collect this kind of information, it becomes a rich new source for learning and discovery. So I believe that we will see a pickup in the way that body monitoring can help healthcare in that way. All of this, I don't believe, is the point. Don't let the right answer distract you from the real answer. Now, I'm not saying that we can just rush all the way to what I'm about to tell you. It's not going to get there tomorrow. It doesn't work that way. When the personal computer, when the Apple IIe was released, it was really VisiCalc that made it so that people wanted it. People weren't sure what to do with the personal computer. And VisiCalc, which was a spreadsheet program, basically worked in people's minds. It made sense to them because it was a calculator, only a bit better. And people knew what a calculator was, and so it was easy for them to adopt. Funny story, one of the early purchasers, corporate purchasers of Apple IIe's, unbeknownst to IBM, was IBM. It was because people were buying the Apple IIe's and putting them in their office. The accountants were buying them and putting them in their offices because they wanted to hit recalculate in VisiCalc. That was a big deal to them. You have to start with the things that people understand. That's the paradox of new technologies. At first, you have to find that introductory application that makes sense to people. But that introductory application is not always, is often not, I think, where the technology ends up being most important. You can see that personal computers had enough time that we can all look back now and understand that things like Google sort of had to follow after some of these other things, but now the ability to search the world's information is just more important than spreadsheets. It just is. You know, we make, I made a free phone call this morning on Skype. Right? That just wasn't even conceptually possible for the network effect and all kinds of other things at the time. So, I believe that body monitoring is going to change everything because 
When there's inefficiency in the world, things change to try to suck up that inefficiency. Think about the telegraph. When the telegraph was invented, it was almost seen as a toy. There was an incredible amount of resistance to laying the telegraph down across the Atlantic between the United States and Europe. People thought it was, well, they thought it was physically impossible, but they also thought it was a waste of time. In retrospect, we can see that the inability before the telegraph to send messages instantaneously made everything inefficient, or to put it more positively, everything became more efficient. Every industry, every area of life became different after you could do that. We can't see what's going on with people's bodies. That's not about health. Everything that touches humanness, which is pretty much everything we care about, all of those things are inefficient right now. Let me give you an example. When you go to bed at night, why do you have to turn off the lights? The lights should just know that you just went to bed. Now here's the problem. No one is going to wear something on their arm or wherever just so the lights will turn off. It's not worth it, right? You wouldn't buy a personal computer 25 years ago to keep your calendar program. It just wouldn't have been worth it. But if you already have the computer and then somebody makes it really easy for you to keep track of your calendar, that sounds like a good idea. And before you know it, there are 10,000 applications on the personal computer. And that's what's going to happen to body monitoring. No one of them would be worth keeping it on your body. That's why health is going to be the first thing. Because it's critical, it's important, well, everyone cares about their health. But once it's on our bodies, there are going to be so many other things to do with it. Why do we type our passwords in all the time? I don't like keeping track of my passwords. I can't imagine anyone in this room likes keeping track of their passwords. Why do I have to justify myself at the airport manually? If I was wearing a body monitor and they were prepared to extract my bioidentification directly from the monitor, it's much harder to spoof than getting a photo ID, for example. It's much more secure and it's much easier for me. Again, I would never wear a body monitor just so I didn't have to type in my PIN at the ATM machine when I extract cash. But I would be happy not to have to as long as I was wearing the body monitor anyway. I'm giving you examples here of things that are a little easier to imagine because we already do them. I'm just making them easier right, in our minds. But there are going to be so many things that aren't just easier because we're going to do it without the typing or what about the temperature in this room? Somebody just set the temperature in this room. The temperature's fine, but it's not optimized. We could optimize the temperature in this room if some of us were wearing monitors for skin temperature, for core body temperature of the people in here. We could actually do it to keep everybody from falling asleep. We could try to optimize for something like alertness, the, uh, some measure of the autonomic nervous system, or happiness. Actually, levels of stress or uncomfortableness are measurable using body monitors. We don't, it's just, it's so different, it's subtle, but we don't think about a thermostat as a place where you express the happiness of a person or a group of people. But it could be. It can't be because we don't know anything about the people. That's what the body monitor is going to release. Every aspect of our lives is like this. You go on a dating site and you see how people talk about what they're like. Really important. They communicate um, their lifestyle to people, right? Oh, I, I exercise and I sleep right and I do this and I do that. It's all self-report. And this is one of these moments where you really want to know what the other person's like. Wouldn't that be nice if you could get like the actual facts, some kind of objective summary of, of their lives? Again, no one would wear a body monitor for this. But I guarantee you that 15 to 20 years from now, no one will be able to go on a dating site without showing what their actual lifestyle is like. I bet everyone in this room, now that I've said some of these things, can think of a few more. I'm going to leave a little bit of time for questions. I'm happy to give some more examples, but let me sort of go up a level or two. Um, I'm actually going to take an aside just for a moment for just public policy comment. 
just crossed my mind. So this really bugs me. There are so many hidden costs in energy that uh, most of the rest of the world is much better about, the United States is particularly bad about. And body monitoring, by allowing for action at a distance, many of the things that Takeo was talking about too, allow for people not just to get better care and more help, but to get it in a much more energy efficient way because they don't have to be moved to where the help is. They can do it remotely. And we're going to have to do everything we can as a planet just to keep the energy crisis from getting worse any faster. I don't even have hope that it'll get fixed. But anyway, to slow down our impending doom as much as we can. Public policy uh, should be that we should be taxing energy much more than we currently do. And then one of the things I believe we should be spending it on is body monitoring and quality of life and some of these other things. But by spending money on action at a distance kinds of things that don't involve the spending of lots of energy to move big heavy things like people around when you can move bits around instead, that's worth spending tax dollars on because it's going to address that issue. Okay, so public policy rant over. So, you know, I, I've just described some kind of um, super comfort features as I know that they sound right now. Whether or not the thermostats of the future work the way I work is totally irrelevant. It's not the point. It will come to pass that body monitoring, that the knowing of what's going on with our bodies becomes as critical as we now think about wireless technology, as we think about the personal computer. It will affect absolutely every aspect of our lives as fundamentally almost as electricity does. It's the most fundamental way of expressing implicitly who we are and what we want, what we need. So let's just say for argument's sake that I'm right about this. So what do you do about it? I'd say that there are about three different ways that you could approach um, this situation. The first is um, Alan Kay once said that the best way to predict the future is to invent it. So if you really agree, then you could go out there and try to invent one of these applications. I encourage you to do that. I've spent some time doing that myself. It's, it's a risky and somewhat exhausting experience. You know, the way I think about it is like pioneers and settlers. If you are a pioneer and everybody lives over here, this is where the town is, this is where the water is, and you say, I think that land way over there is a good idea, I'm gonna go take some of this land. It's easy to get this land, nobody wants this land. Eventually, right, this, that's, that's New York, that's Boston, you know, 300 years ago in the United States. This is California. Eventually, this is gonna be really worthwhile real estate, but it's gonna take a long time for it to be worthwhile. The people who actually make the most money are the people who take like one step away. They move just a little bit outside of the normal environments, but they're close enough that they can effectively piggyback on, in the analogy that I'm making, the physical infrastructure of the towns nearby. But the same is true in a technology world. You can't ask that people adopt technologies where they're just too disconnected from the ones that we currently do. So if you're gonna be like Alan Kay suggests and go uh, invent or uh, predict the future by inventing it, I would recommend that you pick strategically some of the things which are near enough to health that they will make sense to people and that they will effectively leverage the kinds of reasons that people will be wearing body monitors in the next 10 years anyway, which is mostly obesity, uh, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and frailty, just general aging. Those are, I believe, the, the main reasons that people will be wearing them. So the second thing that you can do, and in a way this is probably the most exciting, it may not be the way to make the most money, but it's probably the way to make the future come to us as fast as possible, is to make your platform open. Anyone who lets other people have good ideas on top of their body monitors is going to see a proliferation of ideas that they never thought of. This has never not happened in the history of technology. Anyone, any group that makes a technology is just essentially universally wrong about what its most important applications are. 
But you can count on the fact that if you let other people play with your technologies, they'll come up with the future. So that's an exciting way, I think, to um, see the future come to us as fast as possible. Probably the easiest thing to do is just to be aware of this, just to be open to it, to invest your time, invest your money um, in, in as though the thing I've described to you will be the case. Or at least when you see it happening, coming towards you, don't resist it, but ask fundamental questions. If I tell you that the light bulb that I've made is going to just screw into the ceiling, talk to body monitors in the room, and turn off when everybody goes to bed, I think your question shouldn't even bother to be, is that a good idea or not? Eventually it will happen. The question is whether enough people are wearing body monitors that it'll actually have traction from a practical perspective, and how much that feature is worth. I guarantee if it was a penny, people would pay the penny. The question is whether they would pay the $10 it'll cost for you to make the first ones. That's the problem. So in conclusion, I'm encouraging you to think about body monitoring not as a health application, but as a way to access the very most general, most missing piece of information I believe we have in the world, what it is that our bodies are and need. And that eventually will be broadcast in every way and will touch and manipulate every part of our lives. And that's going to be a pretty exciting uh, thing to watch since it's going to happen in our lifetimes. Thank you very much, and I'll take questions. So, I'm going to ask you a question. How are you going to do it? Okay, I'm Takashi Omori from Tamaga University. Thank you for your talk. It's very exciting, and it, it, I, I believe your talk about the possible future of body monitoring. But when we consider human, body is just a part of human. We also have a mental system, and they are tightly connected. But I'm sorry, I couldn't capture your concept about the possibility of mental modeling in your talk. How do you think about it? Sure, let me uh, restate that. Um, there's actually a lot of work that's already gone on and it's very exciting work. The question is, I call it body monitoring uh, because that is directly what we're looking at, is signals from the body. And the question is, ultimately, what our body is, is of some relevance, but it's actually even less relevant than what our mind and our soul is. Well, it's hard because those are subjective experiences to monitor them directly, but it doesn't mean that you can't come to conclusions about them. Let me give you some examples. You know, the first one, which I mentioned, is sleep. Sleep is a physiological state, but it's also a mental state. Uh, the second is that when you look at a pattern of states that people are in, for example, if you see that I've gone for a walk from 10 in the morning to 11 in the morning, every day for the last 10 years, and all of a sudden, I've been lying in bed for four days straight. I'm not sure what you've learned about my body, but you've just learned something about my mind, haven't you? Right? You have to infer things about people's mental state, because they can't be monitored directly. But you can learn a lot about stress, depression. You can learn about um, things like uh, hyperactivity. Uh, these are all, you know, if you see me sort of jittering, uh, I was actually talking to somebody this morning about using heart rate. Um, and there's a technology called MIR, micro uh, wave radar, so that you can see somebody's heartbeat from up to 50 feet away under somewhat idealized conditions. What about using that, not by itself, but as an example, so that when somebody's going through the airport and their heart's going thump, 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 you could worry about their body, but you also might make a conclusion about their mind that they might be up to no good because their heart's beating so fast. So um, the general statement is 
I think it's very rich in opportunity. I think most of the opportunities, you remember when I was talking about the thermostat, I described it as a way to make everyone in the room alert or happy, um, keep them from falling asleep, that those should be the goals. I don't even think it's really about the body per se. So the only bad news is it has to be inferred, but the good news is it can be. Hi, どうもありがとうございます。他にいかがでしょうか。Any other questions? Hi,、uh, thank you very much. It was a very nice presentation. Thank you. And、uh, I'm glad you are pointing so far in the future.、Uh, just a, a little thought that when you were talking about this、um, monitoring,、uh, like in this room,、uh, automatically adjusting temperature and so on. Are we going towards a kind of big brother?、Hmm. Um, that's a very reasonable question to make sure that everyone understands.、Uh, the question big brother is a reference to the、uh, state controlled system in the novel、uh, 1984, the concern that the state would know too much about us and ultimately would have too much ability to control us,、uh, would take away a lot of our individuality because it would know more about us. Uh, I'll make several observations. The first is the body monitor that I'm wearing is optional. It's not attached to me, it's not sewn into me. I can take it off if I want.、Um, but you'd be surprised. We have hundreds of examples of people who've had sex that we know of, and probably thousands that we don't. People just forget to take it off.、Um, That, that's not an argument that Big Brother won't happen. It means that people understand that it's optional, and in the end, I believe they come to the conclusion that the source that they're giving, at least body media's information to, is trustworthy. The second one is people always worry about Big Brother. I'm not faulting you, it's an important thing to worry about. But when you look at other areas, like credit cards, when you use your credit card around the world, the bank is building up an incredible. History of what you do, where you do it, what you like, and often very personal things about you. And people are willing to do that so they don't have to carry some extra paper in their pockets, some cash, mostly. For convenience, people will give up almost all of their security. And I'm sorry, I know that that sounds cynical, but that's just the behavior of people. I think in the end,、um, <sighs> It's worth worrying about, but I believe that on balance, like most technologies, it can be used for good and that it will make people's lives not entirely better, but on balance better. Actually, let me use a, just a specific example about the credit card. Did you know more people use their credit card records to prove their innocence in court than to, to, to show their guilt? More people bring up their own credit card records and say, no, 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 I was here on that day. I wasn't there. And look, I have the credit card records that show I was in that store. So I think in some interesting ways, it may be used to make people freer. Thank you. So、uh, the, the, how you, you, you put the, your sensor armband into the market almost five years ago. That's right. And、uh, you collected the 50 minutes of the, the sensor data. Five billion.、Minutes. Five billion. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Five billion. So, uh, uh, so, you already acquired so many, so much data, and、uh, maybe the people were happy with that. And、uh, what, my question is、uh, what is the, the growth of the sales, and what the reputation of the, the armband, and what the, the people want for the next, next version? So,、uh, I can't be specific. We're a private company, so I can't give you the specific numbers, but I think I can satisfy you generally.、Um, we sell many more、uh, now than we did even a year or two ago, almost by an order of magnitude, by a factor 10. If that gives you some sense of the rate at which the, the co our company is improving, I believe that. The space of body monitoring is growing almost that fast as well. There are several other companies, like CardioNet, is another one that I would point to. I referred to it earlier as、um, it's an ECG company, so you do have to glue stuff to your body, but it very effectively calls your doctor anywhere in the world. You, you know, I could be wearing it now, I don't happen to be,、um, and you can get help. It's a, it's a nice company. There are several others like that.、So, 
the field is growing very quickly. What people want, they want it to be invisible. They want it to be free. They want it um, to have no experience when it touches their body. Um, they probably want it to defy time and gravity as well. Uh, but what they really want the most, more than those things, what they really want is information. They want a dashboard for their bodies. And 98% of the requests that we get are specialized requests that boil down, that essentially are, can you make my dashboard more about me, more specific? So the runner will say, I want to see lactic acid build up in my legs. And the, in, the informal caregiver will say, I want to see whether the onset of frailty, that magic moment when my mother goes from being able to take care of herself to not take care of herself, if that's happened. Right? Everyone has their specific thing, but they're trying to get more information. They want a richer dashboard. That's basically what people want. Interesting. Thank you very much. So your time is up. Thank you. Thank you very much. えっと、次はあの、コーヒーブレイク。